Hi, and welcome to Bright Minds from Tickmill. I'm your host, Patrick Munley, and in this series, we're setting out to answer some of the most commonly asked questions around investments and trading through entertaining and insightful conversations with seasoned insiders. Rapidly advancing technology continues to cause disruption to almost all industries, and the world of investments and finance is no different. The internet and mobile tech has allowed access to markets and information to flourish, leading to vastly increased opportunities for retail investors. Between January 2020 and January 2021, monthly downloads of retail investment apps more than tripled. And since that initial explosion, retail investing is more popular than ever. But access to e-trading apps is not the only big tech-driven change we've seen in recent years. The AI-driven financial advisory market size is set to increase at a compound annual growth rate of 29.7% between 2022 and 2030. And with the rise of AI and so-called robo-advisors, we will undoubtedly see an increase in people entering the markets, as well as the many inevitable changes to finance law, process and regulation as financial institutions try to keep up. We take this accelerated rate of change for granted, but of course, it wasn't always this way. Before the huge advances in technology that we see today, activity and therefore power in the markets was much more concentrated in the major exchanges, such as the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, and relied much more on human interaction, relationships and instinct. Our guest today, Tickmill UK CEO Duncan Anderson, has seen all these changes firsthand. Duncan's financial training started on the old open outcry floor of life, LME and the CME in Chicago. And since then, he has gained over 30 years of experience in the financial sector. Today, we'll be discussing the role that technologies such as algorithmic trading, mobile tech and high frequency trading have played in revolutionizing the way the industry works the pros and cons of increased reliance on technology, and we'll also take a look at what the future holds for tech in trading. Duncan, thanks for joining us today. Uh, could you get things started by telling us a bit more about your career so far? So uh, my, my first introduction to, I guess, the trading environment came as a sort of a very young 16-year-old working uh, holiday shifts at an old <laughs> uh, city commodity trading house uh, which was based in Sugar Key, um, and I think the name itself sort of you know sort of points to the sort of historical. <laughs> Gives it away, <laughs> um, but that's probably uh, you know one could talk about that for for, for ages. So I'll, I'll save that for another day. But what I what I do remember was you know on the fourth floor they had uh, individuals that were tasting coffee, they were tasting sugar, they were they were sampling other sort of commodities. So all these things were coming through. And the smell was, you know, I, I, I still can't get it out of my mind now, but uh, it was intoxicating. And uh, you could also hear the clatter of the telex machine, you know, spitting out information, people running over to it and saying, oh, my God, you know, there's a, um, <laughs> there's a, there's a frost, you know, in Florida or, 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 or something like that. And, um, and the noise of, of the individuals sort of uh, talking and trading and uh, explaining and, uh, you know, all the, all, all the hustle and bustle of actually sort of phone-activated voices. I actually spent quite a lot of time also licking envelopes uh, and, and some of the prospectuses <laughs> that were being uh, licked, so to speak, uh, <laughs> turned out to be for the first uh, billion-dollar futures fund. But... I, I, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, yeah, I worked on these exchanges and, uh, yeah, that included the old life floor and the Royal Exchange, uh, the, the, the LME, and ultimately sort of in Chicago on the CME. Um, and that for sure was a pretty noisy experience as well. Uh, I, I, I then went, went on to sort of set up a, a small little hedge fund, uh, which ultimately yeah. became a sort of fund of funds, which right. very much geared towards systematic trading. And, uh, on returning to the UK, uh, worked for uh, a well-known uh, CFD uh, house yep. uh, on their US equity desk, and uh, and that led to uh, other opportunities, which ultimately resulted in uh, in the current position where I am at Tick Mill. So, um, just as you were, you were running through there, Duncan, um, something that came to mind, and in, in terms of how technology has, has really shaped the development of the investing and trading world. Um, your 
explanation regarding that high level intensity of human reaction or interaction, sorry, um, versus what you eventually got involved in in terms of the trading side being systematic and obviously, I guess, highly automated. And it's 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 somewhat of a, di, um, a, a juxtaposition between that high level of human interaction in in your when you started out versus that move into technology and systems and a far more i guess regimented approach to investing and trading absolutely and and i think the type of individual also makes a huge difference because what you might find on the on, on a trading floor in the old days it's not necessarily the individual that you'll find building a uh, a quant strategy with python uh, today a lot of the characters i guess uh, once the migration really set set in in terms of moving from that open outcry experience to the screens i guess the industry probably shifted from a a persona dynamic into that more um settled environment of 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 development as opposed to the hustle and bustle of a, of an open outcry trading floor yeah i mean i i, I remember certainly the old life floor on the on the royal exchange and which is opposite the uh Bank of England, LIFE stands for London International Financial Futures Exchange, um, that sadly no longer exists. But uh, uh, it was it was this sort of most amazing sort of um, uh, environment. So you can really sort of make it up. Um, but it had what we all need, and uh, is is uh, an area for price discovery. And what follows on from the old days is you have exactly the same thing today. Uh, certainly, futures markets uh, will use price discovery, even though there is no pit. But there, you had sort of you know people standing in these sort of uh, literally uh, pits uh, where they were yelling and screaming at each other, banked by a whole cacophony of phones and other individuals signalling into the pit. Uh, and runners like me would be, you know, hustling and bustling and uh, <laughs> trying to take orders and uh, get back to the phone receivers. And uh, you were, you were, you know, constantly on your feet trying to ensure that the madness turned out to be actually something that was uh, relatively orderly at the end of the day. <laughs> what do you think, in terms from from your perspective over the lifespan of your career so far? What do you think the biggest technological change has been? I mean, you talk about the telephone. I mean, that at some point would have been a major shift for um, for the markets, when, when as opposed to just uh, the exchanging of tickets, moving to the telephone system, and then I guess now thinking about the internet, etc. What what how what do you think has been the the, the big game changer? I think on one side, I guess the pit to electronic was a hard for many of these older traders to to uh, to adapt to, and they have by and large sort of mainly disappeared. What what we have now is programmers with the ability, not just able to trade one particular market, but they can trade multiple markets over different time horizons, and this is just as one singular individual. Uh, I mean, it's fascinating from that perspective. I guess from a provider perspective, um, in the early 2000s, there were roughly three or four main providers, but the barriers to entry were, were huge. I mean, uh, the cost of building, uh, cost of uh, servicing was 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 e enormous. And again, this was the sort of the beginning of build of platforms that you could actually electronically trade over. So the cost there was uh, significant. The, w the one outlier was MetaQuote's MT4 uh, because, sure. I mean, literally overnight, it, it allowed you or me or any individual who was able to code, who was able to uh, create a trading strategy to start competing with, uh, you know, with the big boys. And what do you see as some of the challenges, specifically for yourself as, as the CEO of a major platform provider, what are some of the challenges in terms of addressing the uh, potential pitfalls for first-time investors, first-time traders? How are Tickmill using their technology to guide uh, traders or potential investors to make uh, make better decisions? This is a really key question, and I think from a from a company perspective, any trader, the very first thing you do is you, you, you want to provide a, you want to find a provider. So uh, you look at balance sheet, you look at longevity, 
you look at the uh, uh, relationships that uh, the provider has with liquidity providers. Uh, uh, so all around sort of structure. Is it an entity that's going to last? Obviously, with the, being a UK entity, Tickmill UK um, has pretty, you know, sort of rigid and resilient uh, uh, sort of environments uh, purely because we're regulated by, you know, one of the sort of, you know, largest uh, regulators in the world or most well-known regulators in the world that that are, in many respects, it's, it's quite painful. But at the same time, if you're investing your money, you, you want to actually ensure that, you know, that company is going to be around and the regulator does a very good job of ensuring that that actually happens. But I guess once you've found a provider, the fact that you can trade like a pro, like a quant, like, a, like, like an institutional player, is that uh, it, it actually then comes down to you. So... First, you, you, you really got to understand exactly what you want to get out of this trading opportunity, this business, yeah? And you've got to treat it like a business, yeah? And you can't really, you can't, you can't sort of uh, bullshit yourself, uh, excuse my French, but you, you, know, you have to know what you are getting yourself into and you want to have to know what you're getting yourself into. Um, you've got to create a strategy. You've got to then test it. And of course... Uh, we're talking about technology. Th these are all very, very sort of easy things to do as well. Uh, you you want to ensure that you protect your capital. Um, so when you actually come to trading, you, you've only got a finite amount of it and you've got to know what to risk and what not to risk and, and not deviate from that. And I, I think probably for me anyway, though, so the most important thing is, is you don't think that you're God on day one. Um, because you will you, you will get cut down. It's uh, it's as simple as that. Uh, it, you know, it trading can be brutal, but at the same time, it can be the most beautiful sort of uh, exercise as well. So I always try and sort of act like I know nothing, and research, 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 research. Yeah. And by 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 acting like you know nothing, it actually puts you on a sort of a, a I think on a better footfall than than actually thinking you you know everything. One of the the, the fantastic aspects about the platform access is like you say that um that focus initially on back testing and and stress testing strategies and systems that in in previous decades would have taken a huge amount of resource and and man hours to to execute yeah. whereas now over like you say the mt4 platform that the technical have or the mt5 platform or even through these futures um platforms you can back test a strategy w within minutes and get feedback on the the performance potential of that strategy and and also understand the dynamics in terms of execution and what you know how how that impacts the strategy going forward and then you have the ability through the platform obviously to forward test it with a reduced potentially reduced amount of capital before applying more meaningful uh, meaningful assets to 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 a strategy yeah so the, i i think the use of sort of demo accounts uh are vital uh the use of starting small and seeing how it goes tweaking and as you say, back test, forward test, perhaps not try to optimize too much. From a sort of back testing perspective, you create a strategy, whether it's in your head or on a paper or whatever. And if you then have to program it, or even if you don't have to program it, you can still utilize uh, an Excel spreadsheet. And the concept of the back test allows you to see how your strategy may have performed in the past. And by doing that, you can cut out a significant amount of potential error when it actually comes to trading real money. So it's a very valuable tool to help a trader refine a strategy that has some resilience and robustness um, going forward. And uh, you made a couple of great points, actually, um, Duncan, that um, I personally, when I work with, with traders, I really try and underpin in terms of when you're looking at automation and backtesting is this idea of optimization and, and curve fitting. I guess the uninitiated trader wants to make the strategy as perfect as possible, whereas as I guess you know and I know that really simplification is the key to performance and reducing the amount of optimization often produces a better strategy. 
Yes, and uh, it, you build a strategy, and then there is technology out there uh, that allows you to say, well, if I did this and I did that, then I can maybe get a slightly better result over here. But of course, it, it tends to only work for a limited amount of time, if at all, in fact, because you 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 end up building something that never really would work in, in the real world. Um, I don't know if there's a better way of explaining that. No, I think I think that's a that's that's a great way of explaining it because I mean, ultimately, with any any strategy that you backtest, it as every financial outlet tells you, past performance doesn't necessarily <laughs> imply future results, yeah. and so you are ultimately confined by historical data. And as we've lived through just in recent times a pandemic and inflation spiraling, no one knows what the next market cycle is going to be. So you can only rely to a degree upon that historical data. And if there has been decent performance, then you can anticipate, I guess, decent performance in the future. Whereas if you try to optimize the strategy too much to the historical data, yeah. The future data can really send things awry, yeah. and and that's I mean that's a, a, a really good point because it it the future will always throw up something that you've never experienced in the past, maybe apart from a war, but uh, but uh, uh, <laughs> you know trading through these environments if you've never actually traded through them, it uh, becomes significantly more difficult, and and of course the the temptation to to fiddle around is constantly there. Are there any other downsides that you see that can broadly impact investors who are using technology to a greater extent? I guess uh, there are some points where you know tech has sort of heightened the uh, herd mentality of traders. We've seen uh, some of these sort of uh, flash U.S. crashes, uh, U.S. stocks going through the moon because the herd mentality has uh, dictated that a hedge fund is is uh, uh, not looking after them properly or, or, or trying, to, trying to push the market down. But I, I've always believed that sort of in general, the market itself will find some sort of equilibrium. But getting to that point, it, it definitely uh, tech has created these, these sort of uh, these uh, inflection points that, that a trader really needs to be wary of. So you know, interpreting what the market's going to do probably has become more difficult uh, uh, as there are, you know, a number of new variables that that you need to process. HFT, high frequency trading, is, uh, I mean, that's away from the sort of normal sort of uh, capability of of traders like yourself and I, Patrick. But again, we 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 have to be aware of them, you know, especially if you're starting out and you're wondering why on earth, you know, something major. I mean, the market's moved in, in the way it has. You, we absolutely need, need to be aware of these things that do happen. Duncan, thank you so much for your time today. Um, just for the, the audience and listeners, is there anywhere that they can go online maybe to follow you? Uh, I have a LinkedIn profile. Uh, I'm also on the sort of uh, on the Tickmill blog uh, in sh some shape or form. And uh, Great. very happy to take uh, uh, and speak to anyone from an email perspective. I know it's old school. I'll even pick up the phone for someone as well. So, Fantastic. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And once again, Duncan, thanks for your time today. Many thanks indeed. Thank you.